Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. Are you leaving gains on the table if you're not training to failure? A new analysis has explored the relationship between proximity to failure and muscle hypertrophy, and some influencers say this paper proves training to failure is necessary for maximizing hypertrophy. But I feel there are some critical details people are missing. Before dissecting this, it's worth knowing prior to this new meta regression, there have been three meta analyses in the last three years, combining the results of the overall literature all finding no significant difference in muscle hypertrophy between training to failure and not training to failure. An issue with these meta-analyses is they simply compare training to failure versus non-failure. Non-failure is vague. Are we talking about one rep from failure, two, six, eight, or even ten reps from failure? This is where the new meta-regression comes into play. It's evaluated how precisely different proximities to failure impact hypertrophy. Now, this meta-regression is currently a preprint. It's not officially published or peer-reviewed, changes to the paper can still be made, and if any notable changes do occur, I'll have an update. Nonetheless, let's dive into the current contents of the paper. The new analysis collected all the studies that compared how different proximities to failure influence muscle hypertrophy. For the groups that did not train to failure, various estimations were made to calculate how many reps in reserve they left. That is, how many reps away from failure did they stop? Here are the average training variables used in the studies analyzed. Ultimately, the results indicate that muscle hypertrophy improves non-linearly as you get closer to failure. This is largely the only thing you see across social media. Since the analysis finds greater hypertrophy with failure, people have concluded failure is necessary for maximizing growth. However, the researchers actually detail some interesting additional analyses, and importantly, there are limitations. The researchers established an interaction with load. With heavier loads, there was less of a benefit of training nearer to failure versus with lighter loads. This might be quite logical. Nearing failure ensures you're recruiting as many muscle fibers as you possibly can, but heavier loads, contrary to lighter loads, readily necessitate high levels of muscle fiber recruitment in general, so getting nearer to failure could be less important. Nonetheless, the researchers also outlined a range of moderators. Most notably, in my view, higher frequency of training a muscle group, higher set numbers per muscle group, and longer study durations. With each of these moderators, there was less of a benefit of training to failure. In fact, null point estimates were within the confidence interval. In layman's terms, this leaves the potential possibility that there truly isn't a benefit to failure. This new meta-regression is the most comprehensive analysis of how different proximities to failure influences hypertrophy based on the current scientific literature. At the very least, this analysis only further reinforces the notion nearing failure is crucial for hypertrophy. But does it, as per the main analysis, prove training to failure truly maximizes hypertrophy? I don't believe this analysis can prove this, and the researchers themselves allude to this. There are inherent limitations to the existing body of literature on training to failure. The definition of failure differs between studies. Some use the definition of momentary muscular failure, while others note concentric failure, but some just state volitional failure, which is a lot vaguer. Recall we had moderators which meant the benefit of training to failure became less. I've yet to mention that studies using a definition of failure, such as momentary muscular failure or concentric failure, were classed as a moderator. That is, in these studies the benefit of training to failure was less. Another consideration is the majority of the studies did not report how many reps in reserve the subjects not training to failure left, meaning the researchers had to use a variety of equations to estimate reps in reserve. I think the authors did as good of a job as they could have done, but the estimates are simply far from laser accurate. Take this study by Martirelli. We'll focus on two groups, both training the barbell biceps curl. One group performed three sets of repetitions to momentary muscular failure with a 70% one rep max load per session. Another group performed three sets of 7 reps with a 70% 1 rep max load per session. How many reps in reserve was this? 
Well, the authors of the meta-regression considered that before the study, the subjects were able to perform a maximum average of 10.37 repetitions with the 70% one rep max load. Thus, they subtracted this from 7, meaning that this second group was estimated to be leaving 3.37 repetitions in reserve. This is virtually the best single reps in reserve estimate you can give, but it's not going to be laser accurate. Remember the subjects were performing 3 sets in a session. The first set of 7 reps likely was equal to an average of leaving 3.37 37 reps in reserve. But the next two sets, due to cumulative fatigue, were likely slightly closer to failure. Another consideration is that the researchers of this study only updated the 70% one rep max load during the fifth week. So subjects were training with the exact same load for five weeks. You get stronger as you train. And so although before the study the subjects could only perform an average of 10.37 reps with this baseline 70% one rep max load, they would have been able to perform more than this as time progressed across the five weeks. And thus the reps in reserve estimate of 3.37 would have been too low across time, at least with the first set. The researchers, quite interestingly, also included a range of studies using alternative set structures in their analysis, such as cluster and rest pause sets, and the equations used to estimate reps and reserves with some of these alternative set structures were also likely far from laser accurate. All in all, I think it may not have been worth including alternative set structures in this analysis, since they are physiologically not identical to normal sets. But the data from the moderator analysis section implies the inclusion of the alternative set structures studies didn't drastically impact the results. Nevertheless, the limitations of this analysis simply preclude us from concluding it proves failure is superior. We need studies that more consistently use better definitions of failure and provide better estimates of reps in reserve. It's entirely possible that as time goes by and we amass high quality individual studies on training to failure versus not training to failure, we'll find different results from the new analysis. Only time will tell. Due to the various limitations associated with the new meta-regression, I still believe analysing individual studies, specifically ones that are high quality, is worthwhile. This 2020 study by Santianello is, in my view, the single best study to date on training to failure. 14 men with an average of 5.1 years of training experience were recruited. Subjects trained both the unilateral leg press and unilateral leg extension twice per week for 10 weeks. A great thing was the researchers individualised set numbers. The Researchers noted how many sets per week the subjects performed for their quadriceps before the study, and then the subjects performed 20% more for this study. For example, if a subject performed 15 weekly sets for the quadriceps before the study, they would now be performing 18 weekly sets, a 20% increase, for the quadriceps in this study, evenly divided between the leg press and leg extension. With one leg, subjects performed every set with repetitions to momentary muscular failure. With their other leg, they performed repetitions till what the subjects perceived to be just prior to failure. With this leg, an average of 1.6 fewer reps were performed versus the failure leg, suggesting this non-failure leg left 1.6 reps in reserve, but it probably fluctuated between 1 to 3 reps in reserve based on the standard deviations. However, remember people's legs aren't always equally as strong, so these estimates are broad. The number of dominant legs was counterbalanced between the failure and non-failure conditions. The fact each subject performed both protocols with either leg is also another strong strength of the study, because this removes genetics and outside lifestyle from interfering with the study's findings. Ultimately, vastus lateralis cross-sectional area increases were not significantly different between both legs. Interestingly, the raw gains somewhat leaned towards the non-failure leg. So the strongest single study to date on training to failure indicates it isn't necessary for maximizing hypertrophy. There are two other fairly high-quality studies, in my eyes, albeit on untrained individuals, further suggesting similar hypertrophy between training to failure and stopping shy of failure. If you're searching for additional ideas about programming for muscle hypertrophy, the Alpha Progression app can help. It has an exceptionally flexible custom workout generator that uses training variables based on meta-analyses and reviews from the scientific literature. Specify your training experience, the equipment you have, and how often and how long you want to train for. You can still individualize things further by editing things to your preference. The app also provides neat graphs displaying your long-term progression, and there's a database of 550 exercises. The link in the comments and description allows you to try everything on the app entirely for free for two weeks. And if you like it and go beyond, the link gives you 20% off a subscription. We don't just partner with anyone at the House of Hypertrophy, so rest assured the app is great. The new
meta regression is a great addition to the scientific research on training to failure, but there are limitations and considerations, and I believe we should still consider high quality individual studies. When we do this, I think it's most level headed to conclude that training near to failure is absolutely an important variable for building muscle, but for the time being at least, I don't believe we can undoubtedly say training to failure is superior. Rather, I think sticking to the general recommendation of getting three or fewer reps from failure, and this includes going to failure if you wish, is most sensible. Feel free to experiment and decipher how to implement this in your training. Of course, including both failure and non-failure training in your program can certainly be done. Moreover, as many of you are probably thinking, there is certainly value in having good experience with training to failure, because if you've never trained to failure, how do you know if you've left two reps in reserve? Finally, other factors can interact with your decision. For example, we've previously seen at the House of Hypertrophy that higher frequency or higher volume training can be viable for building muscle, and with these, it may be easier to predominantly leave reps in reserve. Contrastingly, if you're using lower frequencies and or volumes, predominantly going to failure may be more straightforward. Finally, the current research isn't ample enough to truly delineate the effects of proximity to failure on compound versus isolation exercises, but many find it practical to leave reps in reserve with larger compound exercises, such as squats and bench presses, and go to failure with smaller isolation exercises like curls and lateral raises. There are some other fascinating things related to training to failure we've yet to discuss, such as whether individual differences could exist, and if more sets further from failure can produce similar hypertrophy to fewer sets closer to failure. Furthermore, it seems there's another individual study in the works on trained individuals comparing training to momentary muscular failure to leaving reps in reserve. We will be covering these things in the upcoming weeks and months at the House of Hypertrophy. If you're interested in our breakdown of high intensity training, feel free to check out this video, or if you're interested in a breakdown of training frequency, feel free to check out this video.